Okay, good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to uh, this evening's fireside chat. Um, Admiral Harris, thank you for joining us and uh, other distinguished panelists. Um, so just by way of background, Captain Donald Nisbet recently retired, um, and I am going to introduce our guest speaker this evening. But before I do that, I want to talk about the uh, transition assistance team. Um, and just for the awareness of those dialing in tonight's webinar, uh, you have a dedicated group of team members that are ready to assist and advise um, in areas of profit, nonprofit, academia, government, and entrepreneurship. Um, as a personal beneficiary, um, they're able to provide unique opportunity to introduce their lessons learned. Um, these webinars are uh, a uh, ideal format for that, along with direct contact with the uh, transition assistance team members. Uh, we in the NNOA are fortunate to have these senior executives from a variety of professional backgrounds who have volunteered their time to share their transition experience. And we look forward to um, assisting those of you as you go through your transition process or even consider what next. Um, for the group, any questions that you have, please uh, enter those in the uh, chat and uh, we'll, uh, we'll bring that up to the guest speaker. So tonight we're pleased to have Captain Will Clark, United States Navy, uh, retired. Um, he's the founder and president of Clark Growth and Sustainment Strategies an advisory firm specializing in guiding early stage companies, businesses, and expansions. Um, with his experience in large company executive management and senior military officer experience globally and across international markets, we look forward to his comments tonight with that, uh, that perspective. Prior to starting his own firm in 2020, Will led the global supply chain business unit for Atlas Air Worldwide, where he had both PL, project and losses, and capital budget responsibility in overseeing functions spanning 11 countries on three continents to support and maintain a fleet of 123 cargo and passenger aircraft. He also worked at Best Buy and managing a team and a budget of $500 million to update nearly 1,400 stores and facilities. Before his corporate career in uh, 2015, Will served 25 years in the Navy where he completed 10 deployments in support of war and peacetime operations on multiple carriers, submarines, warship, and shore establishments. He lived and served an impactful finance supply chain procurement and logistics assignments across East Asia, Africa, Pacific, and the United States. He retired in 2015 as a captain and earned his BS in mathematics from the United States Naval Academy, Master's of Science in Finance and Contract Management from the Naval Postgraduate School, and completed a corporate governance program at the Columbia Business School. Will's been married for over 27 years and has both a daughter and a son who are currently Naval Aviation Junior Officers. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce to you, Captain Will Clark. Hey, thanks uh, for the uh, for the intro, uh, uh, Biscuit, really appreciate it. And, you know, thanks for the opportunity to uh, come here and really share a little bit about uh, my background, some of my uh, thought process, and, uh, you know, tell a little bit of story about, um, you know, what I've seen and uh, how I've uh, moved ahead and conducted myself and maybe some of the thought processes for uh, um, that leads up to really where I am today. Um, so, you know, as, as mentioned, you know, um, uh, you know, throughout this, I'll, I'm going to speak for about 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, if you have any uh, sorts of questions, please put them in the chat 
and I will uh, try to, uh, you know, get to those in stride. And uh, so it, this can be as much as possible a uh, conversation and, and certainly um, uh, uh, Captain Nesbitt, Admiral uh, Harris, uh, Tony Barnes, uh, Ernie, Mike Francis, um, if you have any uh, uh, thoughts and questions as well as I go on, please uh, um, uh, step in. So just going way back, and I, I think it's important to really kind of frame um, you know, some of my thought process while I was in the Navy and what kind of led me um, to uh, a bit of where I am today. Um, I started out, you know, at the Naval Academy, you know, back in the days when um, uh, most people at that particular time frame wanted to fly, wanted to be a pilot. Uh, it was the Top Gun era um, and essentially going through, my eyes went bad, uh, went to 2050, and in order to be an NFO at that point in at the academy, you have to be the top half of the class of which I was not. So I said to myself, OK, um, once my eyes went bad in my junior year, I will uh, um, uh, uh, go surface warfare, which is what I did. And, uh, what, you know, within that time frame, uh, I was doing pretty well. But um, I knew that at the end of five years, my five year commitment, I would transition. And that was my thinking at the time. I, I then applied for, you know, after my first deployment, uh, applied for the uh, Navy Supply Corps. Um, and I did that because, uh, you know, wanting to get a, a tangible uh, skill set such that when I did transition very early, uh, I was planning at the time that I would be able to uh, use that to parlay a, 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 a second career of some sort. Um, within that either finance or supply chain uh, arena. Well, transferred over and then, uh, you know, fun started to happen, getting great assignments, going different places, uh, getting promoted um, and, uh, you know, getting command at, you know, 15 years and, and, and uh, it was really, a, you know, a great story. Um, Fast forward a few years, made 06, then, you know, at that point, I really started thinking to myself that for me, for where, for what I always wanted to do, um, that uh, sticking around a lot longer didn't make sense for me. So right as, you know, I got uh, time and grade as an 06, uh, with 25 year point, I decided to transition. And the reason I, I, I say all that is, um, for you know anyone who's on the, the call um, in this fireside chat who has not made the uh, uh, choice to transition yet or you're thinking about it, everyone, you know, we all have our own story, our own thought processes that's endemic to us. And it's important to be able to recognize what that is. And when the time comes um, and you do transition, be able to tell it because sometimes that's even going to come up with respect to, uh, with job interviews and, and different pieces uh, that uh, it's going to be important to be able to tell your story. So in any event, um, a bit on my transition in and of itself and what I was thinking about. Uh, again, going back to myself wanting to have a substantive second career in this uh, civilian world, you know, my thought was, okay, at that point, 25 year point, my, um, uh, my daughter had just started college. I had a son who was uh, um, 16 years old at the time, and he had just, um, you know, just about to finish up his sophomore year in high school. So all of these pieces were, um, you know, things that I was thinking about. And um, as you do transition, or one does from the military, you got to think through, um, you know, stratify what's important to you. Right. And when I say that, you know, it comes, you know, with those discussions you may have with uh, close family members. And also when you're thinking through, you know, well, how much um, money is it that you, you want to try to make, um, you know, what type of company or organization you want to be a part of, uh, whether it's small, large government, um, uh, publicly traded private company, um, what type of position is it that you're looking for? and uh, whether or not you want to be a leader. Um, and when I say a leader, meaning manage people or an individual uh, contributor of which there's you know, tons of uh, 
you know, opportunity there. And then, you know, talking through location, you know, where is it that do you, you know, want to um, uh, work? And then also what's really important is to consider is what sort of uh, um, progress do you want to attempt to make with respect to, um, you know, promotion? Um, are you uh, essentially looking to, um, um, you know, have a career or a position that um, you're, you're, you're making enough to be quote unquote happy? Or is it that you wanna uh, essentially, um, um, you know, uh, be part of the, the corporate steeplechase is, is what we call it on the outside, right? And, and then also, um, uh, but it's important to be able to talk about all of that and know um, <clears throat> with no uncertain terms what you're looking for, even though as time go on, those goals may change and that's totally fine, but at least have something that you can point to. Because what I found is, and is, is if you don't uh, at least codify that or have those questions that you can um, um, uh, answer to yourself or to others, then you may end up in a position where um, you regret it later because you essentially take the first uh, opportunity uh, well, not necessarily the first one, but you don't take the right opportunity based upon, you know, what it is that you um, think you want to do. Um, so with that, in my, for me, what I was looking for was a large public company, one that was non-DOD facing at all. I, for me, uh, what my thought process was, I wanted to get far away from DOD and work in a particular environment where a lot of it would be new and I just have to learn and figure it out based upon um, what I felt was important for me to do to try to you know, learn as much as possible about the outside, about you know, civilian world and, and how that works. The other thing for me was I was looking at, um, I wanted a leadership position where I was managing people. And, uh, um, and that was really important to me, having done that for a number of years and trying to, um, you know, use that skill set again to um, um, build upon that. And for myself, location, you know, it was about being in some sort of major metropolitan area. Um, when I retired, I was living in DC um, and I was looking for positions um, at companies, which was more important for me was the type of company and the position as opposed to the location. And in some way, shape or form within uh, either your transition out of the military or once you're in the military, looking from uh, 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 job to job, you have to look at you know, what's the most important uh, leg of that stool and something you, you're gonna, you, know, you index on something, but then maybe you have more flexibility in other areas. In my case, it was the type of company and uh, the type of position was more important than uh, the location. So you know, essentially that landed me up at um, um, uh, Best Buy corporate headquarters. And there was a lot of things that you know, happened uh, in, in, in the midst of that. And my retirement was in June, the beginning of June. I put my, um, I started networking in the January, six months ahead timeframe and essentially set a schedule uh, for the networking piece, which was extremely, extremely important given um, what I was looking to uh, try to do. And I will tell you that um, the networking is what essentially opens up not only opportunities, but opens up your mind with respect to uh, what it is you think you want to do. And you start learning to tell your story and you go into those in such a manner to um, um, learn as much as you can such that it can then better inform you as you move forward um, with a particular direction that you want to go. So before I um, um, say much more, I don't see anything here in the, uh, in the Q&A. 
Um, let me just stop a second and see if uh, um, um, anyone, um, my colleagues here on the call, uh, uh, Biscuit or Admiral Harris or Tony Barnes, or anyone has a question thus far that I need to cover. Yeah, so uh, Will, um, you, you touched on a little bit some of the, uh, the factors that uh, you had to consider uh, as you're transitioning. Um, and having done that myself personally about a year ago, um, you know, obviously family is a big pull, um, but can you talk about um, some, of the, some of the key considerations that, you know, either forced your hand or made it easier? Um, you know, like you're obviously on your third post-retirement job and, you know, touch on that a little bit, because obviously each time, you know, you're making conscious decisions. Sure. So I will tell you for the, um, um, for the first time, let's say, um, or really in the position that you're in at this point, uh, um, uh, Biscuit, landing the first uh, position is um, um, and, and, and understanding, you know, with myself and my transition, which was I went to a, uh, a new location that I'd never lived before, which was up in Minneapolis, never lived there at all. Um, and the other consideration was that, uh, and, I, and I chose to do that based upon the opportunity. And the other one in, in my case was of course family. I had a, a son who was uh, you know, part of that uh, move. My daughter had already uh, left, she was in college. Uh, and then of course my, uh, my, my, my wife. So, so part of it was really um, uh, the first uh, few months once I landed uh, that uh, position um, was, you know, getting my, you know, getting the family settled, getting moved up there, uh, getting my son settled in, picking a, choosing a, a high school, and then essentially myself uh, and my uh, wife uh, digging in um, and, and learning the ropes of not only the area, but uh, of the corporate life, if you will, and seeing a lot of the differences of how things are done at a large um, public company as opposed to government or as opposed to, you know, in the Navy. So that was first, you know, the first six months end up being uh, a whirlwind in a good way, which was, um, you know, bright eyed, bushy tail and, and figuring things um, uh, out in, in many different ways. And uh, some of the considerations, uh, one of the things that I did that someone uh, hit me to was uh, learning about uh, this book that is the name of it may be backwards on your screen, but it's the first 90 days. Okay. And what I loved about this is, and I read it from cover to cover, it's a quick read, relatively. And just to frame my um, uh, um, frame, what I should do when I get to a company. And again, with zero background of the outside world whatsoever, how do I conduct myself? How do I start getting immediate wins, if you will? And how do I inculcate myself? One of the things that I took from here that wasn't explicitly said, which is what I do no matter where um, um, I go from here, and also um, that I uh, counsel folks to do is when you get to the first, um, um, or any new position, especially if it's a different company. And even if it's not, you can still do this. Uh, the first 30 days, just write down your observations. And I say observations, not judgments, but observations as being the new person, the new guy, the new girl, uh, the new person looking at it from a, um, uh, an, uh, an, an observatory standpoint and just writing things down. And, and why that's really important, I think as many of us know, is that if you don't do this right away, then sooner or later you become part of the fabric. 
and you're no longer you no longer have those new eyes anymore and whatever is happening becomes i mean you blend in with the paint you're 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 kind of like almost everyone else right so the importance of this is that i found is after those first 30 days and actually i don't start it in 30 days i start it right away and then i put it all together within 30 days and i go and sit down with my boss and just say hey here are some observations and it's important to call it observations as opposed to judgments or anything like that because some of it's going to be great some of it may be not so good and you may be so new in the seat that you don't know whether or not it's good or bad and that's why you just call it observations and um and then when you do that a few months later or whatever it is you go back and look at what you saw then and it helps you able to then figure out what sort of um, uh, improvements or change or um, uh, alterations that you want to do within your time frame um, that when you had that very, very new um, 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 look on you to do that. So that's something that, and I've also passed that over to as some of my people that work for me at in any of the positions that I've, you know, been, whether at Best Buy or Atlas, as they come in, you know, I had them do the same thing. And even some of my peers at those companies, I mentioned it to them and it, it, uh, it really works. So, but getting to your question, as far as, um, you know, kind of uh, what happens next um, in the case, in the family case uh, with, uh, with myself, when I was up in Minneapolis, um, and learning a lot and doing a lot within uh, the Best Buy uh, infrastructure during its time of um, uh, turnaround with, um, you know, helping with the store improvements and, 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 and different things. Once my son, who then became a, uh, a plebe or a freshman at the Naval Academy, um, left the home to do that, um, I started really then thinking about you know, through the networking, um, what is the best place? What's the best thing to do, you know, at that point, uh, career wise. And one of the things that, um, I did not have in my background, um, was I wanted to get what's called P and L experience, profit and loss experience. And for those of you who, um, have not, um, um, you know, operate on the outside yet. That's a, that's a big deal in the civilian world when you have profit and loss experience. It's, it's essentially like uh, being a, a, a line officer in the Navy as opposed to a staff corps officer. And it's essentially being a senior line officer in the Navy, right? That's how it's kind of looked at because those with the PL experience of profit and loss, which really gets into, you know, managing, not only managing the budget, but spending it and all the things that go into it that then affect the bottom line of the company. Um, that is the type of experience that I was looking for. So as I started, you know, looking around and networking, then the opportunity uh, came up um, uh, for uh, my next position which is what led me to that, um, which is uh, here in New York, and that's at uh, Atlas Airlines. And uh, that was a, um, a, a great opportunity again. Um, it, it, it moved me, it got me to move back to my um, uh, home area, which is uh, New York. I'm up in uh, Westchester County and grew up in uh, um, Queens and Brooklyn. So that was able to, um, as I was looking at the, the broader scope of the career of the corporate steeplechase, as I kind of mentioned before, and you know, getting that uh, PL experience was something which was really important. So therefore, that's what led me to uh, where I am at this point. Let me see if there's any, no Q and A's, no questions. Okay. So, well, this is uh, Tony, I've got a question for you. Um, yeah. You, you know, I want to take you back to where you, uh, we're at the end of like your first segment of statements. And um, as I think back to several of the other speakers that we have had, and, and you mentioned it uh, a little bit, the value of, and uh, uh, one speaker referred to it as a personal Rolodex, for those of us old enough to know what a Rolodex even is. Right. You refer to it as your network. Yeah. 
but uh, I, I would like you to uh, talk about how valuable that is, especially on the first transition. You build a bigger network, I think, when you're already out, but when you're in, your network is relatively consist of the classmates, uh, shipmates, um, folks you go to a PG school with, et cetera. I mean, that, and, and several speakers talked about how important that was as a resource, number one. And number two, have you ever used any of the more modern digital resources like LinkedIn uh, and some of those kind of things? And, and you would talk to how uh, valuable your, your Rolodex, your personal network, and some of those electronic resources can be in the transition process. Sure. No, great, uh, uh, great question, uh, Tony. Um, the networking piece is essentially the most critical piece that uh, one can do when they are transitioning and whether that is uh, um, getting out um, of the Navy or when you're actually uh, still, um, or once you're out and then you're starting to uh, uh, look for other opportunities. Obviously, when you're in, I mean, we, our networks tend to be other uh, Navy or military people. I will tell you, depending on what it is that you're looking to do, um, other military folks, let me put it this way. It's important to establish a network of folks who are in the um, areas that it is that you think you want to uh, pursue. And, and how do you get there if you don't have anyone who is in those particular networks? It starts by, you know, uh, uh, talking with connecting with all of the people who are in your, as many people as possible in your network, letting them know that uh, you are in fact, uh, you know, transitioning and starting with your story of what it is that you want to do. And, and, and when you do that, then that will tend to start to open up doors and really open up your, your mind and your thoughts uh, towards, um, you know, moving in the right direction. What's really important with the network, again, though, is uh, from my perspective is it's critical that you do it or that you tap into or learn who are those people um, that are within those particular areas that you want to be. And there's really three types of networks. Okay, three types of networks. Um, one of them is your personal network, which is family and friends, people that are close to you. Okay, um, and that you should have and be working, you know, no matter what, you're checking in with folks, just making sure they're okay. The other type of the network that you have is your operational network, which is those people who you reach into, reach out to, to get your day-to-day -day job done, right? That's the operational network of which we all have in our, our particular jobs. The other network that I'm talking about is the strategic network, which is that network of those people who are in those places or doing those types of things that you think you want to do, and that's what you have to build, because that is the network that is going to be most helpful to you if you're trying to get or do certain things. The, again, your operational network is your normal day-to-day, -day. Your, your family network is, and your friends, I mean, that, that's all well and good and you need that, but that strategic network is the one that um, is important to build. But, you know, as we talk about networking, um, there's a book that I ran across about two years ago that I would say I, 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 um, I wish I would have had earlier. I didn't have it, but it's this book here. And it is the 20 minute network meeting. And it's an ex this is the executive edition, okay? And it's really thin, but it's a good one. 
And they're, they have since come out with a, um, an addition for military, an addition for other types of folks. But you know, the one I have is the executive edition. And the premise of this book, which is so true, is that most people do not know how to network, right? This is written by some executive recruiters who have been doing it the whole time. And when do most people quote unquote network? When they need something, right? And a network is something that you should um, be tapping into to check in with folks on a regularly routine basis, okay? Such that when you need something, um, often, you know, when, so when people do it is when they need it, when they're looking for a job, they say, hey, I'm gonna start networking. And, um, and, and that's okay, that's what most people do. But uh, this kind of tells you how to get around that. But it also, what's uh, amazing about this book is it actually lays out different things that you should do going into a networking meeting and then when you're done with it, right? So for give you an example, when you're you know, going into it, you know, how do you get on someone's calendar? What's the best way to do that? Well, there's many different ways you can do that, but just understanding that people are very busy, and especially when you start getting into a strategic network of folks who are doing lots of things, um, it's gonna be sometimes hard to get on their calendars. But when you do, one of the biggest my takeaways for this is once you do land that meeting, how do you prepare for it? So if you're gonna have a half hour meeting, my rule of thumb is if you're going to have a half hour meeting with someone or 20 minutes, you need to spend at least 20 minutes to figure out who that person is that you're going to be talking to, making up an agenda, having some questions that are not based upon saying, hey, how did you do what you did? You can ask that, but you really got to ask things that are insightful and uh, do it in such a manner that you are drawing out information that you think would be helpful to you. And when you do that, you'll find that it's a, a meeting that you can get done in 20 minutes that you can um, be really sharp about and that you're really prepared on. And that the biggest thing is in, in that meeting, figuring out how it is that you can help that person who's given up their time in order to be with you. Okay, and then of course at the very end it it, it talks about um, uh, of course thank you notes and and reaching out and all that stuff at the end. But uh, but that's a book that I highly recommend um, for anyone and um, to really professionalize your art of um, networking. And and the biggest my biggest takeaway from the whole networking piece is when you go into it with the idea to learn about the other person, you often come out with a great outcome, which is to learn about them. And, and without, you're not asking for a job, you're not asking for anything specifically, but you're really doing going about it to learn. And with that outcome of learning, which is the purpose of networking, you may come out with a, when you're done and you may not even know it, an evangelist that's on your side that you didn't even know that was going to, you know, realize that outcome. So that person may be talking about you in a good way um, uh, as a result of how professional you were going into and how prepared you were going into the meeting, as opposed to um, getting on someone's calendar and saying, hey, I just, I just want to talk. And that, that doesn't cut it when you're building a strategic network. So and I, just, that. I just dropped the I just dropped the link to the uh, Amazon link to the twenty minute executive uh, version in the chat. Great, and I would say for that one too, it's um, and there's there's different ones. If you're getting out, if you're transitioning at this point from the military, then certainly get the one for um, that's the military edition, because that's going to tell you some things that, uh, and I haven't read that one, but I can only imagine it's a little bit more specific. Um, and this one here would be a great one um, for 
once you're already on the outside and you're looking at continuing to build uh, that network. Okay. We got something here from, right, right. And a, a, a great comment here from uh, Ray Bynum, uh, Captain uh, Retired Ray Bynum, who mentions that, you know, um, obviously as, uh, you know, senior folks, um, like to mentor those folks who come prepared and um, are, um, you know, have have some, you know, come prepared and and, and show, you know, great initiative, and that that's really important. The other thing I want to mention, though, is that about mentoring, just recognize that those folks who may have been your mentors while you were inside the Navy or while you first may have um, transitioned may not necessarily be the strategic network that you need going forward if you're looking to do something different than they did. So just understand that, right? So. Um, people and mentors are often good for, no, I shouldn't say people, but mentors at times um, are people in your life for a season. And sometimes that season can be very long if you're aligned with doing something very similar. But if you're in a, off in a different direction for whatever reason, just know that it may be time based upon that to um, uh, refresh or get a a more aligned network, strategic network that is going to be more helpful uh, going forward. Okay. And there was something else I wanted to talk about the networking piece. The other thing about networking um, is be sure to follow up with the folks that were helpful. Okay. And one of the things that I find myself doing now, and folks come to see me a lot, is I often do not make connections for folks, and this takes me to Tony Barnes's question, unless they, I give them a name of a person, and I say, look this person up on LinkedIn. Take a look and see if this person will be helpful to you, okay? And if you think it would be helpful to you, let me know, then I will make the connection. And I usually do my connections on LinkedIn, okay? That way, um, you can see the background of the other people. You can both see them and you can engage the two people. You put them together to engage. And if they choose to, then great. If they don't, um, then I always look at that as an affront. If I put two people together and they do not actually uh, take the initiative to engage one another. Um, and that's why I often have them you know, take a look and see if it's something that's worthwhile and makes sense. First, I ask them that, and then if it does, then I'll make the connection. Um, because one of the things when you start getting to this level um, and, and trying to be really, really helpful to folks is you don't wanna you know, waste um, anyone's time and you want to be able to connect folks in such a manner that it's helpful, uh, mutually beneficial to both parties. And um, one of the goals that I make is to be able to um, make introductions about between five and 10 per week of two people so that they can then, um, you know, expand their network and, and try to, you know, help each other to continue to uh, elevate, uh, you know, going forward. So, okay. Um, All right, well, no more, no more softball questions. Now comes, <laughs> now comes the hard stuff. Okay. Okay. You know, I think that there are many, many people today that at some point in their life thought that they were tired for working for somebody else and they're ready to go out and work for themselves and start their own business, just like you did. 
successfully. Um, my question really is, how do you know that you're at that point that you can afford to no longer receive a paycheck, but start your own business? And how long can you, uh, you know, chug along, maybe not making the big bucks until you realize this wasn't such a good idea? How do you, how do you know when you're at that point to where you're ready to go out on your own? Okay. Um, well, certainly that's a, uh, um, it's a personal question for everyone. And let me tell a little story here. Uh, and when I say story, I mean, it's a, you know, a, 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 how I came to where I am with that. I want to say it was back in November of 2019. Um, when I asked my financial planner and I said, give me a couple of, I want you to run a couple of scenarios for me. And here are the three scenarios with all with the intent of knowing when can I stop working, right? Which means stop altogether. And I said, can I do it? in five years? Do I need to work for five more years or 10 more years? And of course, this is all based upon the salary um, that um, I, you know, I had at the time and based upon many different factors, family situations, kids, bills, yada, yada, yada. And he said, okay. He came back to me about two weeks later and said, Will, have a seat and my wife. And he basically said, you can be done now. And I said, really? He said, yeah. He said, let's think about this. You have your pension, right? You have X number of dollars already put away. And you can maintain, and of course, also, um, and the good thing is, he said, and, and, and your kids are already set, right? My son, you know, um, at the Naval Academy about to graduate, my daughter had just graduated from, uh, from college, and they, neither of them have any student loans or anything like that, so they're, so they're done. So I thought through that. And I said to myself, okay, um, it probably took me a couple of months to chew on it, to figure out, well, should I continue with the, with the corporate steeplechase, right? Um, which pays really, really well. Or do I then, I don't wanna say pull back, but figure out, what is in fact next uh, for me? So after praying, thinking through, thinking about it all, I said to myself, I'm gonna take it to the next level with respect to getting on, looking at how can I give back and give across to both individuals as well as companies based upon my military experience, based upon my global supply chain and aerospace defense experience at the airline, based upon my retail experience, based upon my PL experience, and look at that and help steer and run companies and, and, and help individuals be more successful. So I will tell you in April of 20, after I had it figured out that this is what I kind of want to do, I went in and spoke to my boss um, at uh, Atlas and he looked at me like, are you kidding me? So we were about to promote you. And I said, wow, that's very, very flattering um, for what I want to do next. The best thing for me to do is to step away and 
go ahead and um, uh, position myself to be on, to sit on uh, corporate boards, as well as advise companies based upon my experience. And there were quite a number of folks who said, I don't know how you're going to do that. I don't see it. And for me, it, it really didn't matter because it's, and for each of you, part of it is going to be betting on who you are, betting on yourself and getting the type of experience that you need or that you want in order to then be able to fulfill um, your, your, your goals going forward. But I will tell you, had I not had a successful military career retirement, that is, which is really the basis. And plus, of course, um, you know, working a few years and being able to uh, make some very, very decent coin while I was at it. And then, of course, uh, being fortunate in that my kids have uh, done well enough so that there's, you know, and oh, by the way, I still have my GI Bill, right, to be able to use. And um, so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm blessed in that, in that vein. And that's why I essentially put myself in the position here to um, um, start my own consulting firm, if you will, Clark Growth and Sustainment Strategies, of which um, is the umbrella that I use to um, um, both consult with a couple of companies and essentially act as a, a CEO whisperer for a couple of smaller companies who need some uh, uh, help and guidance. And then also um, 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 sit on the uh, boards that I'm sitting on right now and continuing to build that uh, portfolio of service as we go forward. Does that answer your question, Tony? Yeah, that's an excellent answer. And I, I, I said so in the chat. And I'm, I'm looking at the Q&A as well. And Pat Williams put a question up in there that uh, Admiral Harris answered. And I'd like him to, if he's willing to, uh, um, I'd like him to bring that uh, answer, a question and answer to the forefront. Well, I didn't want to stop or, or interrupt what I think has been one of our best uh, transition uh, uh, remarks, set of remarks. So, Will, Absolutely. this has just been brilliant. But what the question was, uh, what if you're not comfortable? And I'm paraphrasing what the question said. What if you're not comfortable with networking? How do you get over it? How do you start it? And my answer is pretty simple. Well, you find somebody you think is a decent networker and you follow. You ask them, hey, can I, uh, you know, see how you do it? And, and that to me, and ask them if they'll help you. You know, maybe they'll help introduce you. Maybe they'll show, okay, here's what you want to ask. Here's what you want to say, all these type of things. But that's what I would recommend over. And, and actually for, for that type of question, I would say certainly get this because this will take you through that because there are many people who are not comfortable doing it and who, who think or feel it's a little bit slimy you know, networking and, and, but it's, it's, a, it's a roadblock. And when you look at this, and again, this book, it'll give you some tools and techniques to, you know, reframe some of the thoughts and, and what's really, really super critical again, that I found is spending the time once it is that you do get a, a, a meeting on someone's calendar to look at them, their background, their company, what they're doing, and things are good. And you will come across so sharp that you'll be blown away at how well the meetings go. Now, what I will also tell you is you're going to find, everyone is going to find, I found, there are going to be people who are very, very helpful in your network. There are also going to be those who are not helpful at all. And that will floor you. And when you come to those that are not helpful, it will happen. It's just a fact of life. You just have the meeting, 
be done with it, say thank you, and just move on. And don't take it personal because it is just going to be a fact of life. Okay. And, um, and I will also tell you that I've looked, <laughs> I had a couple of networking meetings. This was me, you know, going out and doing certain things where I had something on the calendar and then I, uh, somehow may have dreaded that meeting for whatever reason, it could have been something happened in that day or whatever it was. And then I just got pleasantly surprised at how well it went and how helpful it was. So, so you, so you never know, you, you, you have them, you take them and you help others and you just keep going forward. And I will also tell you for people that get on my calendar to uh, uh, talk or discuss, or for me to help, I spend time learning about that person beforehand as well. Um, even if it's, you know, it, it doesn't matter because it's all about the learning um, learning about folks and, and, and seeing how you can be helpful to them and no matter what, because that's, that's really, really important. You know, there, there was a, a comment that I'll share with you that was in the, uh, uh, in the chat, I believe it was from Denise Michaela Carey. You know, you, you bring up the importance of the security of our pensions as a, as a big plus, but we also need to, and I think this is especially important since the retirement system that we know and love so well has changed dramatically that for well, the importance of good financial planning for our JOs has to be emphasized in our mentoring process with JOs today, because you cannot, I mean, who expects that a junior officer, especially one that happens to get married early or have children early, or a junior enlisted uh, uh, person with a family can afford to put away any large sum of their dollars into a, um, a TSP and, and expect to be able to have that build in retirement when you don't get it started until you can actually afford to do so. Uh, the importance of good financial planning during our mentoring to JOs and to junior enlisted, it can't be overstated. It's just not the same as we had it. Absolutely. That is, that is, that is spot on. That's a, you know, great question and a great uh, foot stomp um, as well. So that it, it really is. And um, I, I tell you, I've, um, I'm fortunate, you know, I got a couple of JOs. <laughs> And, and, I, and I call them JOs, even when they come home, they don't like that. They said, no, I'm just, you know, I said, no, you're, you're a JO and that, that's the JO jungle over there. So you guys can go watch TV or whatever it is. But, well, at least you don't uh, call them your subordinates, you know? <laughs> that's right. But uh, the funny part about that is, is that, um, um, you know, I think that they're ahead of where I was with that, Right because um, they have, uh, um, you know, started, you know, putting their money away. And uh, I'm, I'm even surprised at how much they're saving at this point. Um, but it's, it's um, yeah, we got to talk to uh, the younger folks about that, about being able to do that. And, 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 that, and that's huge. So, so one of the things that why I was really um, just going back to what my financial planner told me why I was really surprised was in all my calculations all along and thinking about whether I need to, you know, how much, how, how much longer I need to quote unquote work um, and, and, and whatnot, I wasn't figuring in the medical piece of how huge that is, right? And, and because when we're having a discussion, I was saying, but this doesn't make sense. This doesn't make sense. And he says, remember, you have medical all covered. So there's, there's, there's nothing. To, and I said, oh, okay, I get it. But, but yeah, but it's huge. Now, what I will also say, though, and again, I think we have some folks who are, um, who are you know, uh, on the line who are going to retire or retire, is that because of that pension, we can take a heck of a lot of risk with respect to what we're doing and what we want to do. Okay. And when I say the risk, I mean, in, in a, a type of job or moving or just different, we can take risk. A lot of us may come out and think that 
you know, we got to be really, really conservative on what we're doing. And there's nothing wrong with that. But just know that what you have is um, uh, a great, um, um, can be an equalizer uh, with respect to, you know, what you end up doing, you know, moving forward. Um, so that's a, that's a huge piece. And the one thing I will just leave, I know we're about to be done here to leave folks with is within the military, within the Navy, often what we're doing, it's a, it's a career, but it's sort of a sprint from place to place, right? Um, I was of the tunnel vision that in the Navy, or in the military, you work harder than anyone else out there, right? And that's not the case. That is not the case. Because what ends up happening is we, while we're in my experience, again, this is based upon my experience. While we're in, you know, we're on a ship, we deploy, we work up, you come back from the deployment, you have a stand down, or, you know, you go from duty station to duty station, you know, they, they all sort of operate maybe with a little bit of different op tempo, but you, you can, you know, sprint for a few months, you get some time off, you can sprint again and, and doing these other pieces. Depending on what you want to do on the outside, uh, or should I say on this side of uh, uh, the uniform and depending on the type of job that you have or the position and what you're responsible for, you could be feeling like you're sprinting in perpetuity, okay? As opposed to that sine wave of what happens or cosine, depending on how you wanna look at it in the military, okay? Um, so for me, I just, um, it, it was an eye opener and it was just because something that we weren't, you know, um, um, I wasn't used to. But there is tons and tons and tons of opportunity that's out here in companies um, that it will just really um, blow your mind. And you don't find out about it until you learn about it through talking with people in different industries and learning different vernaculars and learning about different companies. And that's the beauty of the networking piece of which, you know, half the time I was coming out of some of those meetings saying, I had no idea. Right. And then that's 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 the beauty of the learning piece with it. All right. So, Captain Clark, um, I'd like to thank you personally for uh, taking the uh, time tonight and share your uh, words of wisdom. Um, and I'd like to turn it over to uh, Admiral Harris to close this out. Hey, uh, Will, thank you. Uh, gold, pure gold. I especially appreciated the way you broke down the types of networking between strategic operational and tactical level networking, how your network changes over time. And the ones who were your mentors, at one point, uh, you're looking for different mentors and different coaches and different advocates as you go through. The books and reads were fantastic. Uh, I, I hope people understand, or understood, I know I understood it, and we've talked before, yeah. That this relationship building that you do, whether you're in the Navy or after you get out of the Navy, um, is not a transactional thing. It's not a tit for tat. Yeah. Okay. And don't expect it to be. Um, you will certainly find those who are more helpful and you will talk to them probably more often. Um, but uh, the way you talk about, um, you know, being aware and, and engaging you know, early on and often was, was certainly key. So thank you, great remarks. Uh, Don, thank you for leading us through this uh, wonderful discussion and setting this up for us. Uh, really appreciate uh, that and the work that you're doing at uh, Navy Mutual Aid, uh, which helps all of our shipmates uh, every single day. So thank you for that. Uh, of course, uh, the two, uh, uh, 
protagonist in this play called Tat, uh, Tony Barnes and uh, Ernie Taylor. Thank you, gentlemen, for continuing to lead, continuing to help others, continuing to have that servant attitude. And, you know, I don't know how we would get around uh, without Mike Francis and his technical savvy, his ability to make these things seamless and easy for us, even after he finally gave up the seat as in a ways IT lead, right. the, 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 I'll call it the black hand of uh, Mike Francis continues to keep us uh, appointed fair. So thank you, thank you all. Emma, we call him the wizard. He's, he's that, that guy behind the curtain doing magical things back there. That's right, that's right. Um, I ask everybody who's listening to this, please share this tat. I mean, we've had wonderful speakers and I hear people ask me questions because I've transitioned you know, six years ago now um, all the time. And, and there's so much wisdom uh, today and, and some of our other speakers, quite frankly, all of our other speakers, um, it's to be shared. You know, people ask me, hey, look, have you checked out this? Please share this sure. on your social media, any way. LinkedIn is, of course, a preferred one for professionals. Right. Um, so please do that. And it, now you know what I'm going to say, right? Don't forget the 50th. Save the date. Register now. We got the price down as low as we're going to make it without being having a freaking heart attack. All right. But go ahead and get your room reservations in Annapolis. It's going to, it's going to fill up and it's yeah. going to be fantastic. And you're not going to want to miss it. So please, please, please um, uh, go for it and, 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 and plan to spend the whole time because Friday, aside from our banquet and, and right now we're working with uh, Barry Black as our banquet speaker. Um, We've got Michelle Howard and, and others coming for Founders Day. And you know that if Captain Dr. Rick Wright is in charge of it, it's going to be fantastic. I think Rick's on the line tonight, too. Why do you think I said it that way? <laughs> so thank you all. And uh, over back, back over to y'all. No, thanks for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. And uh, if I can be helpful to uh, folks uh, moving forward, you can find me on LinkedIn and, and I, you know, happy to help elevate. Outstanding. And of course, it goes without saying that from most of our professional careers, probably the greatest networking system that we participated in was the NNOA. And the difference it's made in a bunch of our careers. Um, we're retired as 06s for that reason, many of us, or 05s or 04s, whatever it was, but the professional networking that happens at an NNOA national conference is you can't buy it anywhere. And that's what we've told our national leadership, our, our service chiefs, and that's why they come to see it in person. So we we'll look forward to seeing everybody here in Annapolis um, for the 50th. Right. Biscuit, you got the last word. Got to get my controls. All right. Um, again, thanks everybody for uh, dialing in. Uh, we're looking at uh, setting up another one of these next month. So stand by for uh, additional information. But, uh, you know, obviously we'll have the recording on the website uh, in the uh, tap page. And any comments or suggestions are always welcome. Thank you all and have a good night. All right. Thanks. Great job.